Luke chapter 15, we're going to start all the way in verse 1, and we're going to read all the way through this chapter. I think it's kind of okay that we read a bunch of scripture on a Sunday morning, right? I think so. I think you've heard most of these uh, verses before, and um, if you need a Bible, there's one right in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take that Bible home. That's our gift to you, uh, or the words are going to be right up on the screen as you see. So Matthew, or excuse me, Luke Chapter 15, we're going to be talking about lost things today. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over, of, of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. 
But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Three amazing parables that Jesus gives us back to back to back right here in a row in Luke 15. And, um, one of the things that I love to teach on, and you guys probably know this, you guys have probably caught this before, is, is the character of God, the personality of God, how God acts, because I believe that so many people, when they're brought up, whether it's in just a church that doesn't exactly get this right or a specific denomination or they've just kind of picked it up from the world or their friends or whatever or maybe the attitude of, of Christians and they think God is just this big meanie. They think God is just ready for us to mess up so he can whack us with this big stick of correction, right? And that's how a lot of people see God, but that's not the true character of God. And so I, I love to teach on the character of God. So, um, as we are working through, we are still working on our journey to the cross. Today, we're talking about the preaching of Jesus. The preaching of Jesus. Last week was the proclamation of Jesus, and this week is the preaching of Jesus. And we said we're going to take something from this and kind of scrutinize it a little bit, look at it a lot closer. So we're going to look at the parables of Jesus. The parables of Jesus. So um, there's this true story. Um, there was this preacher uh, and he had to go out of town for a conference, so um, he lands at the airport, and he, he gets in this uh, taxi. And the taxi driver, he's driving a little bit crazy, and he's, you know, kind of whipping in and out of traffic, and the preacher's, uh, you know, a little bit scared. And sure enough, they get in an accident, and they both die. True story. I know, it's horrible. Um, so... <laughs> So they both die, and they, go to, they both go to heaven. They're both believers, right? And they get to the pearly gates, and St. Peter is there. And he's like, welcome. Come on in. Let's go. I want to I show you around and show you your, your mansions that you've earned. And so they're walking down the street, and they come to this first mansion, and they, they look at it, and, and uh, the preacher's like, wow. And, and St. Peter says, preacher, this is your mansion. He's like, Wow. That's really cool. Thank you. He's like, all right, well, we'll just come on. Let's, let's continue the tour. So they go a few houses down, and they come to this, this other mansion, and, and it was massive. I mean, like, huge. It dwarfed the preacher's mansion. And, and St. Peter looks at the taxi cab driver, and he says, sir, this is your mansion. And the preacher's like, what in the world? Why? Like, I dedicated my life to God. Like, like, like every week I was, I was preaching and, and, and service to God and all that. And St. Peter says, well, the entire time while you were preaching, people slept. The entire time when he was driving, people prayed. <laughs> I say all that to say no sleeping today. Just kidding. All right, so parables. We're going to talk about Jesus' parables a little bit. What in the world is a parable? Well, uh, parables actually, about a third of the time that Jesus taught, he spoke in parables. And, and a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or parallel. That's kind of what that word parable means. It's, it's kind of a parallel of an earthly story that would get your attention with a heavenly meaning. So, um, there's three reasons to tell a parable. Uh, number one, to appeal. Number two, to reveal. And number three, to conceal. Appeal, reveal, and conceal. So number one, to appeal. He, it, it, Jesus would tell these stories. And no matter if they were a believer, no matter if they were a skeptic, stories get our attention, don't they? We love stories. We love to hear just how, how things work out. And tell me the end. You can't leave. You know, Isla is just at the age where she's starting to watch these series. And she watches all of her shows. And, and they're just kind of an episode and an episode and an episode. Well, we've started to watch uh, some other shows now where they kind of, the storyline kind of builds and builds. And I remember the first time we watched it, she was just like, the episode ends, and it was this massive cliffhanger, and I'm just like, you know, that, that's just how it's supposed to work, right? And she's like, oh, but, but, and she's freaking out, but she's like, what happens? I was like, well, that's why you watch another episode, and she really couldn't fathom it. So those, those stories, they really grip our attention. So number one, Jesus told parables to appeal. Number two, he told them to reveal. 
and he was revealing the kingdom of God to them. Now, all the time, again, remember, a parable is an earthly story with a parallel of a heavenly meeting. So uh, to appeal, to reveal, and the third one is a little bit confusing. It takes a little bit digging into. He told parables to conceal. He would kind of conceal what he was trying to say only to his followers there. So uh, the, the, he was concealing the teaching from non-kingdom-minded people is what he was doing. Here's an example. In John chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Jews then responded to him, this Jesus, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And it's like, what are you talking about? There's no way. And so they replied, verse 20, they replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? I don't think so. 46 years it's taken to build this entire temple. There's no way you can tear this temple down, much less rebuild it in three days. But Jesus wasn't talking about that temple. What was he talking about? Himself. Three days in the grave, and he rose again. That's what we're getting ready to celebrate here uh, in a couple few weeks. Uh, and then there's the parable of the sower. Remember, right after the parable of the sower, the disciples come to him, Matthew 13, 10. It says, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Now, so again, he's concealing, but, but we were like, why would Jesus do that? Wouldn't he want everybody to get his message? Well, he knew who the real skeptics were. So he's like, this is kind of like for my inside people to understand. Here's the best example I can think of um, that would, would, would be a parallel. You know, like an inside joke? Like you've got your friends and, and your friends, you guys, you think this thing is the funniest thing ever? And then have you ever tried to go tell an inside joke to somebody else that's not on the inside? It's an absolute disaster, isn't it? I mean, not like any of my jokes that I tell here on Sunday mornings, but like, like when people tell inside jokes, they're an absolute disaster. It's the same thing. These parables were kind of like an inside joke or an inside teaching or story that only they would get. So here's what I wrote down. If you're seeking God and his kingdom, God's word will appeal to you and will reveal to you the truth. If you're seeking God and his kingdom, God's word will appeal to you and will reveal to you the truth. But see, you've got to be seeking his kingdom. That's why, uh, remember the Egyptian that was out in the desert and, and he was reading and, and the prophet goes up to him, he's like, what are you reading? He's like, listen, I need you, somebody to explain this. I have no idea. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and he's like, and, and so then he gets it explained to him. Then he went and got baptized. It's extra credit right there. But it's like, revealing to us something if but we've got to be seeking God we've got to be seeking his truth and God will reveal that to us when we do so so these uh, parables in Luke 15 they tell us a few things and we're gonna we're gonna inspect several of those things but they tell us something about ourselves something about God and something about God's ways Oftentimes, when we read through parallels and even we, we read through the teachings of Jesus, we will see these things and, and, and we need to look for them. We need to look, okay, who am I in this story? And, and here's what we tend to do. Who do we normally place ourselves as in the story? The good guy, right? Guess what? We're usually not the good guy in the story, but that's what we think. Okay, so the story's going to tell us something about ourselves, and then it's going to say something about God, because again, we, we need to constantly be like tuning out what the world is saying about God, or what you've maybe been taught before, some incorrect thing about God. But then really what's also super important is to learn about God's ways. And when we learn how God works in certain circumstances, like I prayed and God didn't make it happen. God must not be good. Now, that's an oversimplified story, right? Like, I had a problem. I prayed about it. God didn't fix my problem. Therefore, God doesn't love me. Again, oversimplified, but through a progression of time, that's often 
the conclusion that people come to. So when we can understand God's ways and how he works and that, you know what, sometimes he, he lets us live in that mess that we've created. Sometimes we need it to hurt just bad enough to say, oh, I'm never doing that again. That was dumb. I am not going back there again. Sometimes maybe we didn't even cause it, but God always has something for us to learn. So, so when we understand that God's trying to work and teach us and grow us, you, you don't just go to the gym one time, walk out of there, and you're just completely buff, right? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of exercise. It takes healthy eating and, and, and all of these things. And over time, you will see increases. And that's how God likes to work in our lives. Sometimes, boom, he just flips the switch and, and does the thing, and that's really cool. Usually, that's not how it works, is it? So we're going to learn something about ourselves. We're going to learn something about God, and we're going to learn something about God's ways. You guys ready to do this? Here we go. Seven things about ourselves, God, and his ways. Number one, we are lost. Surprise? We're lost. And, and primarily, we're going to focus on the parable of the lost sheep. I wanted to read that whole passage there. We're talking about lost things, but primarily, like I said, we're going to look at the parable of the lost sheep. Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray we've gotten lost we've like we've 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 just gone off the beaten path away from the shepherd every single one of us all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and if we're turning to our own way whose way are we not turning to god's we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him. Who is that? Jesus. Sign language. I saw some people signing yesterday, so I got it in my head. Jesus. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. We've all fallen short. We've all turned away from God. God had a perfect plan, and our sin messed it up, didn't it? Our sin, and it goes way, way, way back, but that's constantly messing up and getting in the way of God's plan for us. But God chose to send his son to make atonement for us, didn't he? That word atonement, that's just one of those big churchy words. You can say it as at one meant. He brought us together as one with him. Romans 3.10, here's another one. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I love this verse. Many years ago, um, I, we had a band at my other church, and we called ourselves No Not One. Just, it was kind of the joke, and it was like, you know, when we get big and famous and we're touring all over the place, we'll have to remember this verse. There is none righteous, no, not one. Obviously, a super big joke because we never made it, okay? I don't know if you realize that or not. Um, but just a reminder. There is none righteous, no matter how cool you are, no matter how big you've made it, no matter how many zeros in your bank account, no matter nothing. None righteous, no, not one. We've all fallen short of God's glory. So number one, we're lost. We are lost. But that's bad news, right? The good thing is there's good news too. Number two, God loves lost people. And again, here's one of those things about God where we think, no, 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 God loves good people, right? No, God loves everyone, but particularly in these three stories, God loves lost people. And we're going to see, I mean, we're going to put a big fat exclamation point on that here in a minute. God loves lost people. John three 16, you, you've heard this verse before, once or twice, for God so loved, who? Is that pretty much everybody? I think it's everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, if we've learned anything about the world in the last several months that we've been talking about the world, are the people in the world living in light or in darkness in the spiritual sense? Darkness, right? Yeah, and see, the funny thing is, that's the people that this is talking about. The world, all of us sinners, there is none righteous, no, not one. God loves lost people. 
He loves us. God loves lost people. So it, it's going from bad to better, right? We are lost. God loves lost people. But it gets better than that. You ready for this? Number three. God is in pursuit of lost people. Like, not only does he like, okay, you know, they're, they're dumb, like sheep, okay? That's why we're compared to sheep all the time, because sheep are not the smartest animals in the world, okay? But he's like, not only, you know, those group of people that keep wandering, you know, not, not only, okay, all right, fine, I love them too, all right, you, you got me this time, right? That's not God, but God's like, I love those people enough to chase after them. God is in pursuit of lost people. Now, when we read that story, did the sheep try to find the shepherd or was it the other way around? It was the other way around, wasn't it? The sheep didn't really care. It didn't say that, at least in the story. The sheep was just kind of wandering off. And the shepherd was the one that went to find the sheep. Um, think about this for a second. Here's big, big, big bonus points. If Jesus had a personal mission statement, what would it be? There's a particular verse that I'm thinking of. Think about it just for a second. If Jesus had a mission statement, what would it be? There it is. I heard it. Very, 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 you got, all of you get one million points, okay? Cool. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has come. Why? Why did he come? He didn't have to. Like, like he was seated on a throne in heaven. He came down here, like, like not as this triumphant king, not that time anyway. He came as a baby born in like the most humble, gross circumstance that there could be. Why did he come? For the Son of Man has come to, here it is, to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. God is in pursuit of lost people. And you can't be too far lost. We often think that. We often think, ah, you know what, they're, they're, just, they're just too far gone. Nope. God loves those people too. And he's in pursuit of those people. Revelation 3.20, I love this verse, I read it all the time. Here I am, now this is Jesus speaking, okay? Jesus is saying this, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Now I want you to picture this, I want you to picture your house. Okay, like, like, like later on today, you're sitting in your house, and you hear this knock on your door, and it's Jesus. Weird, right? That would totally be weird, okay? But I'm just saying, picture this. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Like, there's this picture Jesus is painting of himself standing at the door and not necessarily of our house but of our heart, knocking, going, won't you let me in? Like, I'm, I'm trying, again, the sheep wasn't trying to find the shepherd. The shepherd was trying to find the sheep. And Jesus is here knocking on the door of our hearts, saying, I, I just, I just want to come in. And I've shared this before. Eating with people back then in this culture was so personal. I mean, it, 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 this was such a thing. And so for, for Jesus to say, hey, I don't care about your condition. I don't care if you've gotten your act cleaned up right. No, nothing. I don't care. I want to come in and have a meal with you. That was so personal to them. And here Jesus is basically throwing out this blanket request and saying, here I am. I'm at the door of your heart. I'm trying to knock and just let me in. I want to come into your heart. You ever heard someone say that they're trying to find faith? I'm just, I'm, I'm on a pursuit to try to find God. You ever heard anybody say that? Newsflash, God's not lost, okay? And oftentimes when we're trying to find our faith or trying to find God, God's going, mm, no, because I'm right here. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. You don't have to find God. He is in pursuit of you. God is in pursuit of lost people. Number four, 
God carries lost people. This is, I mean, this is just getting better and better, isn't it? God carries lost people. Verse 5, it says, and when he finds it, finds the sheep, watch this, he joyfully, there's our, our key word, joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sheep. All right, there was a, a neighbor of mine just kind of around the corner, and he was an FWC guy, and he actually had a sheep over in his yard for a while. It was pretty cool. Um, so, but I don't really know anything about sheep. So I went to Uncle Google, and I Googled, what is the average size of a sheep? Because here's the shepherd. He goes and he joyfully, not begrudgingly, joyfully puts the sheep up on his shoulders and carries it home. Anybody know what the average size of a sheep is? It's 100 to 220 pounds. Wowzers. So you guys know I, I love to work out and do CrossFit. We have these things, they're called wreck bags. And I don't know why they call them wreck bags other than they just wreck you. But we have these 70 pound bags and they're about this long and about this big around. And you throw them over your shoulder and you, you go out for a really long walk. Actually, the uh, Good Friday, there is a, a, a workout called the Passion Wad. And one of the things of that workout is to carry the 70-pound bag 800 meters. And that symbolizes Christ carrying the cross. So anyway, a 70-pound bag is really, really, really heavy, okay? And to carry it 800 meters, and that's basically just kind of around the block where we work out. Can you imagine carrying a 100 to 220-pound sheep for who knows how far? The sheep wandered off probably more than 800 meters. And the shepherd did it how? Begrudgingly? Joyfully. He picked up that sheep, threw it because he was so excited that he found that sheep. And, and here's the thing. The sheep wouldn't walk him, like, like because, because I was thinking again, I don't know anything about sheep, okay? I'm like, well, why can't he just like hook up the leash and walk the sheep back? Apparently, that's not how it works in shepherding. You don't just hook up a sheep. Like, because again, sheep are not the smartest animals in the animal kingdom. That's why we're called sheep. But so, like, he was either stubborn, and, and apparently, sheep, what, what happens is if you knock a sheep over and they're not down on all fours and they're kind of on their side, they can't get back up themselves. <laughs> Special animals, okay? And that's probably the picture of the sheep. He's kind of on his side going, bah, you know, like one of those things. And like the shepherd's like, you dummy. But he's so happy to find it, picks him up, throws him over his shoulders and carries him all the way back. But see, God carries lost people. God knows when we finally have hit that point, we can't even get back up on our feet again. And God knows that's where he needs to be. And we say, God, I'm done trying to do this thing on my own. Please step in. God steps in and he carries us. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, like when we were like falling over, we're like, nah, okay, we can't get up at just the right time when we were still, ooh, what's that word? Powerless. When you had nothing left to give, that's when Christ died for the, the good people, the people that were getting their act together. Nope, Christ died for the ungodly. What an interesting choice of words. That's when Christ died. And again, I, I, I love this as Paul is writing these letters to the Romans. He says this thing. It's like when, when you were at your biggest mess, when you were powerless, when you were ungodly, that's when Christ died for you. And then it goes on, verse 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. And then I had to put it in there. It's my favorite verse. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Christ comes along, scoops us up, and carries us because we are powerless. As we talked about last week, compared to his salvation, we have nothing to offer. 
Our good deeds are like filthy rags compared to his grace and his mercy. So God carries lost people. Number five, God throws a party for the unlost. And so I had to use the word lost, okay? I couldn't deviate from that. So unlost just means the formerly lost. God throws a party when someone becomes unlost. Again, verse five. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. God's so excited about this. He, he, he throws this party. He's like, I, I, they came back. They came back. They, they went off on their own. They did their own thing. It, just like I suspected, it didn't work out. But they came back. I have found my lost sheep. They are no longer lost. God throws a party for the unlost. But the story doesn't end there. It builds and builds and builds. Number six, God is more pleased with the lost who search for righteousness than the righteous who are lost. Now, this is a big one. This is a really, really big one. So back in those days, you guys have mostly heard they had the scribes, and those are the ones that wrote down all of the scripture. Okay, you had scribes, you had Pharisees and Sadducees. Basically, you had all of these religious leaders. And I mean, they dressed the part, they walked the part, they talked the part. Everything looked great on the outside. It, all that information was right here. And it never made the 18-inch journey down to here. So that's when we're talking about these righteous people. They, they, were, they thought they were everything. Now, we don't have scribes and Pharisees and, and, and Sadducees anymore like that necessarily. But you ever met one of those people? You ever met like some people who they are so secure in their faith and their Christianity and it's almost like, oh, get, get away from me, you dirty sinners. Has anybody, uh, I know we took the men's group, anybody seen the movie the Jesus Revolution? Okay, shameless plug, great movie, great movie. I checked this morning, it's still playing at Tavernier Town. Um, I still want to call it Tavernier Town Twin Cinema. If you don't know what that means, you haven't been here long enough, but such a great movie, and, and the movie is the story of uh, this, this pastor, Chuck Smith. <clears throat> he was in this very small church, and, and it just, you know, had a handful of people in it, and, and they were super churchy people, I'll put it that way. And all of a sudden, this, this guy, Lonnie Frisbee, enters into the scene, and he is one of those, what they're starting to call a hippie. Right, And then these hippies start coming to their church. Oh, no. No, 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 no. See, they didn't wear the suits, and they didn't talk the talk, and they like sometimes didn't wear shoes <gasps> in church. Oh, my goodness. Right? And they like, like, no way. And they actually go to Chuck Smith, and they're like, listen, if you're going to have those hippies in here, we're out. What did Chuck Smith do? He was like, peace out, Girl Scout. And they left. And, and, and that's when, boom, the church blew up. Great, great, great story. That's where Greg Laurie comes from and the Harvest Bible Crusade and all of that. Great movie. You got to go see it. But there are people who are like, it's, it's almost like, again, just, no, just, you can't be in here. You don't look like an, a Christian. You don't act like a Christian. You don't have all of your junk together. And I'm so glad that that's not how God sees us. Such good news. God is more pleased with the lost who search for righteousness than the righteous who are lost. Verse 7 says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture heaven erupting in cheering and praise the moment that you accepted Christ as your Savior. Because that actually happened. 
Isn't that crazy? Like, like heaven erupts the, the moment you've decided to give your life to Christ. Heaven goes nuts and throws a party. And that happens, Scripture tells us, every time. Now, here's what's really interesting. I didn't know this until I was digging in and, and researching this week. Um, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they had a saying in their day. And what Jesus is, is doing with this verse right here, verse 7, and he does it again. He's playing off of their saying that they used to have. When, when Jesus said verse 7, these religious leaders would have lost their minds because it was completely contrary to what they thought. Watch what Jesus does. William Barclay, who was uh, a minister of the Church of Scotland, a professor of divinity, he was born in like 1907, okay, a great theologian. He says this, and he's talking about Luke 15, these parables that we just read. He says, we will understand these parables more fully if we remember that the strict Jews said not there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, but there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. They looked sadistically forward not to the saving, but to the destruction of the sinner. Wow. Great religious leaders, huh? That the, that the guys that you want leading up your church and congregation? You better have your act together or else they're praying for you to be obliterated before God? Wow. Yeah, but see, God doesn't feel like that. And Jesus intentionally reverses a saying of their day, and he shames them. He shames them. Another time, Jesus would say this, and he, he tells this directly to the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 21, the second half of verse 31, he says, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Oh. You think that really set them off? Yeah. Okay, so like we think tax collector, we're like, ugh. You said tax collector to them, that was like the scum of the earth. And then you just might as well just add the prostitutes in there. Oh my goodness. That was the lowest of the low scum of the earth to them. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. They're entering the kingdom of heaven before you because they know that they are in need of a savior. And you don't even see your need of a savior. You think that you can earn your way, that you can add to God's grace and mercy. That God is so pleased with you. Jesus just nailed them. So number six, God is more pleased with the lost who search for righteousness than the righteous who are lost. And number seven, God finds joy in the saving of the lost. Again, a little bit redundant, but I want to just really point this out. God finds joy in the saving of the lost. Now, watch how the words joyful and rejoicing are repeated over and over and over and over again. Verse 5, when he finds it, talking about the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And then it goes down a few verses in the parable of the lost coin, and he basically repeats the same thing again. And then in verse 10, uh, I think he does it in 9 as well, but in verse 10 it says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, that's a lot of joy, and that's a lot of rejoicing. And I think Jesus was trying to make a point as he's saying it over and over and over and over. Three parables in a row, all talking about lost things being found. And lost people, that is just sinful, oh, they're too far gone, just sinful people who have been found. And Jesus says there is joy and rejoicing in heaven because of that. Now again, we, we rarely attribute joy to God. 
right? Often when we think about God, God the Father, we think about, you know, God in heaven, and, you know, we have to say his name differently. I don't know why we do that. But, like, we think of, like, the authority, right? The guy that makes all the rules, and he's keeping tally if you're doing the right things or not. That's often how we think about God. But that's not actually true. That's not one of the characteristics of God. Yes, does he see everything? Absolutely but I, I love that C.S. Lewis says this. He says, joy is the serious business of heaven. Isn't that great? Isn't that different than you've always seen God? Joy is the serious business of heaven. And we sang it over and over and over again this morning already. There's joy here in the house of the Lord and there is joy in heaven, especially when somebody repents. When somebody says, you know what, I, I, I'm done wandering. I need to be found. I need to be unlost. Heaven and ultimately God are all about joy. And God finds joy in the saving of the lost. One more time, I'll, I'll read this verse and then I want to read through our passage here. Luke 19.10, Jesus' mission statement. For the Son of Man has come, why? To seek and to save that which was lost. Let's read that verse together. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So good. So good. One more time. Luke 15, 1 through 7. I won't read the whole chapter. Don't worry. But I want you to listen to it now. Understanding God's heart about lost things. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Realize, the worst of the worst, they were the ones that wanted to come and hear Jesus because he had a message of hope. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. There's that super personal thing of eating with somebody. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's pray. God, thank you that you love lost things. And thank you, God, as we read a couple of times in Romans chapter 5 that in our sin, in our mess, before we got cleaned up, before we got just all of our act together, before we did any of that, you died for us. Thank you that that's the God that you are. God, I know, I know you're not seen as that many, many, many times. I know often we as Christians, we don't portray you like that. God, sometimes churches teach differently than that. God, I know the world says way differently than that. But no one gets to speak about you, God, except for your word. And your word is very clear that you find joy in saving lost things. Thank you, God, that that's the God that you are. That you're not just a God of wrath and judgment and all that, but you are a God of love and of joy and of peace and of comfort. God, help us to rest in that. God, I know that there's people here this morning attending in person or online, God, that, that need to be carried. God, that they have wandered off from the fold. God, would you find them, pick them up, and joyfully carry them back? 
God, for people this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, right now in this moment, would they choose to say, God, I want to be yours. I want to be your sheep. I want to be found. I felt so lost in my life. I don't want to do it any longer. If that's you this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you just feel lost, would you just right now this morning just say, God, I need you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. I turn from my sin. And I turn towards you. God, I trust that your son Jesus died for me so that I can live eternally with you. If that's you this morning, you said that for the first time today, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out, cause any commotion, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up this morning and say, I got it right today. I made the choice to give you my life. Thank you. Thank you. Today's the day. God, I want to give my life to you. Find me, God. Thank you, God, for the perfect sacrifice and gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you that we not only get to celebrate that here in a couple of weeks, but we can celebrate that every moment of our lives with every breath that we take. Help us to give you praise, God, for sending Jesus for us. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to leave his throne in heaven, but he chose to lay down his life for us. God, and in turn, may we give and live our lives for you. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, use it in an awesome way. God, help us to be generous givers. God, help us to be a generous church and to further your kingdom in this community and in this world. We love you, Jesus. We pray this all in your awesome and mighty name. Amen.